security is with people on the phone and help them make sense of whether it's something that's fine, something that's just someone's opinion or has come from a campaign group or hasn't been published. Um, we know it's made a difference in society because when we launched it, science stories in the newspaper never really included the citation of where the, the study they were writing about was from. They never really said if this is a published study or not. They didn't distinguish between something that one man working in a shed in the back garden had said to something that was published in science. But now they do. Almost every science story in the papers says something like, in the journal Nature, out today, or presented at the conference of the American Heart Association this week, or something like that. Because when they don't, we ask them, and the public now ask them, why not? Because journalists have been asked, why not by the public? I think the public expect it, so they do it. And when they do it, when the public sees it's not there, they ask why it isn't there. So it's this sort of spiraling up process, and now everybody expects it to always happen, so it happens more and more. We also know it's made a difference because peer review now has, been, has become part of the science curriculum in schools. It's part of how science works for key stage three and four pupils, and we've produced an education resource based on this document. It's been used by people in such a wide, so many different places. It, oh, it keeps surprising us when people we come across who use it. People in museums, um, people outside science entirely, people in funding bodies, um, people from the TV, people putting together science programs from TV and use it. It's absolutely phenomenal. We're really pleased. The next document in that series of how science works is this one. I've got nothing to lose by trying it, which we worked with neurological patient groups and charities on in response to a lot of inquiries we were getting, and they told us they were getting, from people promoting miracle cures and untried treatments on the internet, especially. The first people who approached us were the MS Society, who told us they were especially concerned by people promoting stem cell therapies, totally untested, unproven stem cell treatments for MS. And their patients were becoming, well, they were very vulnerable already. Because patients get to that place where they've been given this diagnosis of a chronic disease, but hasn't been given a cure, and there is no cure. So that's, they find themselves here. They find themselves thinking, I've got nothing to lose by trying it. That's why we called it that, because that's where they start off. So they're very vulnerable to these, um, well, people promoting dodgy treatments, and they're particularly vulnerable to kind of underhand tactics that people promoting treatments sometimes use, <coughs> such as going on the websites and posing as a patient and saying, this helps me an awful lot. It's really hard to say no to someone who say, oh, you have to try this, this helps this person a lot, why aren't you using it? Patients are really vulnerable to that and find themselves in a very, very lonely and awkward place. So we worked with patient groups to put that document together. It explains what clinical trials are and what a treatment must go through to become medicine. And it's been the most successful thing we've put together and it's had the, most, had the highest rate of um, requests and to be reprinted, reprinted, reprinted. So we're really pleased. We also work with young scientists. We have our voice network, a voice of young science network of a loose affiliation kind of a network of young scientists and junior doctors who love doing things like um, myth busting and hunting for the evidence and enjoy phoning companies up, asking for the evidence of their products and things like that. They also do more serious things, like they got the WHO who to make a statement saying it does not endorse homeopathy as treatment for malaria and other um, infant diarrhea and influenza and other diseases in the developing world recently, which is absolutely fantastic. And the first time they said something about that. So um, voice are really brilliant. They're really core to what we do in sense about science. Getting people to stand up for science and to get out there and get involved and when something's wrong, to hunt down what it is that's wrong about it and respond to it and get people in charge to respond back. Um, we also do more light-hearted things. Such as every year we do our celebrities in science review where we, all year long, we collect statements and stories and quotes from celebrities on something scientific, and then get one of our experts to respond to that statement, to respond directly to the science on it, not in a sneak, snidey or laughing kind of a way, but just to respond to the science. That's really popular with the press, and it gets scientific debate into all these new areas that we never reach. For example, it gets, report, it gets written up in things like Braxia, and in the NME, the New Music Express, so they, once a year they have a scientific debate and enemy, which is really unusual, which is really fun. So everything we do really depends on the scientists we work with being willing to speak out and get involved in public debates and to address misconceptions directly and head on 
that's the only euphemism or that would be the best thing to do it. But in the last few years, we began realising that the libel laws of England were impacting on this. For example, when we put together a document making sense of radiation, we also did a little side project on that where some of our young scientists and medics looked at the anti-radiation products that you can buy that are out there. So one of them was an amulet you wore around your neck which said something along the lines of it would protect you from the nasty EMF radiation from your microwave and your cell phones. But when the guys got that amulet and looked at it and opened it up, it was literally, literally an empty box. It was just an empty piece of plastic. So we went to our scientists and said, look at that, it's an empty box. Isn't that, the people are selling this. People have sold this for $40. They sold hundreds of thousands of it. Isn't it awful? And scientists are very, very reticent to speak strongly and clearly about that. They say things like, well, the evidence for this working isn't conclusive, or I can't really see a mechanism of action for this. Or say, it's an empty box. And then can you just say, this doesn't work, it's an empty box. This is not going to work, don't buy this. But they were really, really reticent to do that, and really cagey about it. And they were speaking in these euphemistic, caveat-written terms, which aren't really useful for people. They were trying to make a decision on whether this is going to be useful to protect their health or not. As well, with our celebrity and science review, we realised that the journalists were asking us for it a week earlier, and a week earlier, and a week earlier every year, because they had to get the lawyers to check with the lawyers, we're getting more and more anxious about it every year. Even though, as I said, we never said anything personally about any of the celebrity statements we were responding to. We just responded directly to the science in it and said, well, actually, you know, Madonna, you can't, you probably won't be able to neutralise nuclear radiation with the ball of water because nuclear radiation is this and this and water and stuff like that. So just about the science. But we realised that all the hard work we'd been doing over the last eight years, encouraging scientists to get out there and to speak out in the public, was being undermined by these libel laws. And it was in the week or so after Simon Singh had a disastrous verdict in his libel case with the British Chiropractic Association last May that left him defending the meaning of his articles that he never meant in, in an impossible place that we realised two things. One was that even if Simon won his case, which turned out to be the case, he did win it in the end, he would lose because it cost him £200,000 to defend himself and two years of his life as a self-employed freelance journalist to take on this case. But he'll never get that time back and he won't get all the money back either. He'll always be about £70,000. <coughs> and the second thing was, as I said, we've been doing all this work and we've gotten scientists who before Sense About Science found it, who spent time grumbling about bad science stories and ads in the common rooms or in the tea rooms of where they worked, but never out there in the public. We got them actually speaking out directly to the public, and now there's this other obstacle coming in their way. So it used to be from where they didn't deign to speak to the public, and now they didn't dare to. So in June last year, we wrote up a petition called Keep the Libel Laws Out of Science and launched it with the support of 200 of the top names in the UK in science and comedy and publishing the arts and the law and we quickly got about 20,000 signatures to that petition. At the same time, unbeknownst to us at the time, free speech organisations Index on Censorship and English Pen were conducting an investigation into the impacts of England's libel laws on freedom of expression for journalists and publishers and authors and biographers and NGOs and human rights activists, um, internet service providers, bloggers, lawyers. And in November last year, they published their report on that, called Free Speech is Not for Sale. Um, Evan Harris, who used to be an MP, who worked with Sense About Science a lot, and is a trustee of English Pen, got us all together with one room and said, you're all here now, so you're scientists, you're writers, you're free, you're free speech activists, you're human rights activists. Why don't we all band together and take this on? And we did. We joined together and launched the Libel Reform Campaign in December of last year with a new petition text at www.libelreform.org. And it's been a fantastic year. We've had so much support we've gotten so far. Thanks to all the support from the campaigning and all our hard work and all of your support, we've made the impacts of the libel laws on science writing and on scientists and on communication and on bloggers something that politicians are now acting on in just a year. And it's brought to light all the other cases that we've been hearing about and we've been trying to publicise in the last year outside Simons. And we've shown, we've really shone a light on this 
insidious chilling effect that English libel law has. We've heard so many stories from really unexpected sources of the libel laws impacting on what people can talk about and therefore what other people can hear and can read. For example, we didn't know this time last year that medical and scientific journal editors don't print some papers, some important papers, or aren't pursuing and investigating stories on things like research misconduct and fraud because they know they won't be able to publish it because they let themselves open for a libel action, which they will find it difficult to defend. We didn't know that medical and scientific journal editors have to consult lawyers for every single issue of peer-reviewed um, journals that they produce. It's astounding. They spend so much money on that. We didn't know that universities are asking some of their staff to moderate what they speak about on their own personal websites, which are hosted by the Institute, because and a, a libel action against an individual's website hosted by the Institute would leave that Institute open to, or, well, libel, and have to defend it, and they just can't do that, it would leave them too vulnerable. There was a survey during the year that showed that 80% of GPs said they don't talk about problems and concerns they have about drug safety because of fear of libel laws. We heard that consumer review magazines aren't just complete and aren't maybe as independent as we think they are, because People like What Satellite and Digital Magazine told us they just don't print reviews about set-top boxes from two enormous high street name boxes and equipment that they have evidence are not fit for purpose because it would leave them open to a libel suit and one libel suit might cause them to fold, it's so expensive. We know that Quinch, Quinch Consumer Magazine, was sued by a double glazing company recently and also by a child car safety seat company for negative reviews. We heard recently, in June of this year, that the Oxford history of Ireland is incomplete. The author told us he left out some things he knows about, some stories about some individuals involved in the troubles in Northern Ireland in the 70s, in Northern Ireland, because it would leave his publisher open to libel suits, even though he knew he knew what he knew was true, and he's been shown to have, to have been true after the bloody Sunday inquiry recently. But he just left it out of the Oxford history of Ireland because, he, as he said, he didn't want to cause the trouble for his publishers. We know that mothers groups and parenting groups have been banned from discussing, discussing particular child-rearing gurus because they've been threatened with libel suits from them before. When poor frazzled, strung out, sleepless mothers were posting at 2 a.m., I don't think this woman's methods are going to work on my baby, and she sued them. Um, we've heard from online patient support groups are told us that they don't discuss certain alternative medical treatments or practitioners because they've been threatened with libel suits. They do it again. They've had to ban some discussions. We know local papers aren't examining the behaviour of local corporations and companies because a single libel suit would cause a small local paper to fold. We've heard just recently about parents, one parent's mother who was threatened with a libel suit by the school her child goes to for setting up a Facebook group to discuss the change in school, school uniform policy. She was sued for libel just for expressing her opinion on that. It's discussions just like these. It's the citizen critics and the local groups. And it's the people who, who never had a voice before, before the rise of the internet, who the internet has given a voice now. It's the local parents, it's the patients' groups trying to support each other, it's the parents exchanging information. So they're the people who are particularly vulnerable to these libel laws, and they're the people whose discussions have been stifled the most. We discovered in the last year 